grab a cup of coffee and start your day with Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life features stories to inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Visit CYACYL.com. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. In the late 1970s, when the government mandated we get the fat out of our food, the food industry responded by pouring more sugar in. The result has been a perfect storm, altering our biochemistry and driving our eating habits out of control. Today's guest, Dr. Robert Lustig, is the author of the book, Fat Chance, Beating the Odds Against Sugar, Processed Food, Obesity, and Disease. To help us lose weight and recover our health, Dr. Lustig presents strategies to readjust key hormones that regulate hunger, reward, and stress. He explains which foods are the problem and which ones are the solution. Dr. Lustig has spent the past 16 years treating childhood obesity and studying the effects of sugar on the central nervous system and metabolism. According to Dr. Lustig, a calorie burned is a calorie burned, but a calorie eaten is not a calorie eaten. Welcome, Dr. Lustig. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Joan. Appreciate it. Doctor, before we begin, I want to let our listeners know that you have a wonderful interview, a video up on YouTube called Sugar, the Bitter Truth, and it runs about 90 minutes, and it's really informative and it's educational, so I'd like our listeners to know that that is one reference point that they can go to after this interview to get more information about some of the things we'll be talking about today. For sure. Uh, you know, it's a 90-minute lecture. Uh, it's on carbohydrate biochemistry. Uh, I didn't even know there was a camera in the back of the room when the uh, uh, lecture was being done. Uh, I had once I found out, I figured my parents might watch it, but that's about it. <laughs> and right now, it's got about th- it's coming up on 3.4 million hits. Yeah. And then if you add the podcast to it, we're coming up about five million views. I'm really happy that it is because I learned so much watching that, and we're going to talk about some of those things now. And in the introduction, doctor, I mentioned a calorie burned is a calorie burned, but a calorie eaten is not a calorie eaten. And I think that that's a major problem with so many of us that try to maintain our weight. Sometimes we think that, you know, well, I just had a bagel all day today, so it's not that many calories. Why aren't I losing weight? And, you know, if you could just give us a little bit of understanding about why that mentality is flawed. Well, uh, look, it's very, very uh, obvious that um, the first law of thermodynamics is a law. Okay. I subscribe to the first law. The first law says energy can neither be created nor destroyed, just shifted around. And I believe in that. Um, you know, if, you'd, if I didn't believe on that, you'd ride me out on a rail. I mean, the first law is a law. The question is the interpretation of that law. You know, the Supreme Court will tell you there are alternate interpretations to every law. Well, there are two interpretations to the first law. The standard interpretation, the interpretation everybody learned, the interpretation I learned, was if you eat it, you better burn it or you're going to store it. And if that's the case, then obesity is a matter of two behaviors, gluttony and sloth. You eat too much, you exercise too little, and that is what the government, that's what the insurance industry, and virtually everybody in America thinks is going on. Problem is, it ain't so. It ain't true. The other interpretation of the law, from research we've determined this, and I'm not the only one who thinks this, is if you store it, that is, an obligate weight gain set up by biochemical forces out of your control, and you expect to burn it, that is, normal energy expenditure for normal quality of life, because energy expenditure and quality of life are synonymous. Things that make your energy expenditure go up make you feel good, like ephedrine off the market, caffeine for two hours, exercise. Things that make your energy expenditure go down make you feel lousy, like hypothyroidism or starvation. So if you're going to store it and you expect to burn it, then you're going to have to eat it. And now those two behaviors, gluttony and sloth, increased intake, decreased expenditure, are subservient, are secondary, are markers for the biochemical process that's going on. And we have shown through our research that the hormones come first. The biochemistry comes first. Biochemistry drives behavior, not the other way around. And so when you understand the biochemistry, then you understand what you can do to alter how your behavior will manifest. And that's a big difference because now it's not about trying to 
diet and exercise. Now it's about altering your environment so that you can alter your biochemistry properly. So, Doctor, what has been going on in the past few years that is changing our biochemistry? Well, I can sum it up in one word, sugar. Mm. (laughs) Sugar is the big kahuna in the story. It's not the only kahuna. There are other things as well. But sugar is by far and away the biggest problem worldwide and also the most actionable. Uh, There are others. Uh, Alcohol is a problem. Trans fats are a problem. And something called branched-chain amino acids, which you get in corn-fed beef, is also a problem. So I'm not going to tell you that it's just one thing. There are several things that can do this, but sugar is by far and away the thing that's gone up in our diet that basically makes this happen. So why is sugar so bad? That's the question. If sugar were just empty calories, which is what the food industry says they are, then, you know, a calorie is a calorie. You know, you get a certain number of discretionary calories per day, about 150 or so. And if you wanted to spend them on sugar, you should be able to. The problem is we do, plus 300 more. Because the average sugar consumption, added sugar consumption per day in America is 450 calories per day. Our livers can't handle the onslaught. They cannot handle that much sugar entering We used to consume an ounce of sugar a day. We now consume six and a half ounces of sugar a day. And the problem is that at that dose, we have uh, uh, overdone our limit. We have gone beyond our threshold for being able to metabolize it properly. And when you over-consume sugar and you're getting this huge onslaught to your liver, your liver has no choice but to turn it into liver fat in order to export it. The problem is... Sometimes it doesn't export it. Sometimes it gets stuck in the liver. And so we now have an epidemic of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. One-third of all Americans now suffer from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and that is the proximate cause of all of the other metabolic problems, including type 2 diabetes, lipid problems, hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and dementia that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, that liver fat, and it came from sugar. Now, doctor, we're getting sugar from two main sources. The first, the added sugar with the Coca-Colas and things, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the other would be people not realizing that by having the simple grains, that that converts to sugar in our body almost immediately. There are two, there are two main sugars. There are actually three. There are three main sugars. There's glucose, which is what's in starch which is what you're talking about, grains. Then there's galactose, which is what's in milk. And then there's fructose, which is the sweet one, which is what's in table sugar, cane sugar, beet sugar, and also high fructose corn syrup, and also maple syrup, agave, and honey, okay, the sweet stuff. They are not the same. Now, galactose gets converted to glucose virtually immediately in the liver. And so galactose and glucose are basically the same. But fructose is not. Fructose is metabolized completely differently. So when you say grains, we're talking glucose. Now, is glucose good for you? Nah, it's not so good for you, but it's not disastrous. The reason glucose is a problem is because when when you eat glucose, when you eat starch, your blood sugar goes up, your blood glucose goes up, your, therefore your pancreas makes extra insulin to cover that. And that extra insulin will drive that energy into fat cells, and so it will cause weight gain. No argument. Glucose can drive insulin. Insulin drives weight gain. I don't disagree with that. So I'm not going to tell you that's good. It's not. But fructose, that's a whole other ballgame, because that's the one that gets metabolized in the liver only. And causes the liver to be sick. And when your liver is sick, that's what drives the phenomenon called insulin resistance. And that's a different phenomenon from insulin secretion, which is what we were talking about with glucose. Insulin resistance is where the disease comes in. So will glucose make you gain weight? Sure, but that doesn't necessarily make you sick. And there's a big difference between fat and sick. The fructose is what makes you sick. And doctor, are they adding more of this into our diet now than ever before? Absolutely. Uh, eight, uh, of the 600,000 items in the American grocery store, 80% of them have added sugar. That's on purpose. The right. food industry knows that when they add it, you buy more. It tastes good and we become addicted. Absolutely. And uh, they know that. Uh, they, when in, in the late 1970s, 
we got the fat out of foods. The McGovern Commission, back in the late 1970s, said dietary fat was the cause of heart disease, and we needed to reduce our consumption of dietary fat from 40% to 30% over the next 20 years. Well, guess what? We did it. Problem is, our sugar consumption went through the roof, and so did our obesity and metabolic syndrome uh, incidents go through the roof. And it was because when you take the fat out of the food, it tastes like cardboard. It tastes horrible because the flavor is in the fat. The food industry had to do something to make the food palatable, to make it taste worthwhile, to be able to sell it. So what they do? They added the sugar. Snack wells, perfect example. Entenmann's fat-free cakes. The bottom line is um, we... Uh, up, uh, we uh, abdicated uh, an appropriate and healthy diet for one that's completely inappropriate and completely unhealthy because of this change that occurred in the late 1970s, and we're suffering for it ever since. The worst part is that the entire diet industry continues to espouse low fat as the treatment for this, and guess what? It doesn't work, and the reason it doesn't work is because low fat means high sugar. Take a look at any low-fat salad dressing and see what they put in it. So we think we're taking care of one problem and we're creating another disaster. And one that was way worse. Now, Doctor, I mentioned the Coca-Cola conspiracy that you spoke about in your YouTube video, and I found that fascinating. I really have to, I have to admit, I was ignorant about it. I really, I don't let my children drink soda just because I, I didn't like it, but I never understood what was in soda. I never read it. I, I didn't know there was salt in it. Um, I knew caffeine, Do you and have I knew to sugar. Put salt in soda? No, you don't have to. Right. Do you remember Royal Crown Cola? Right. There was no so there was no there salt was no in that. No sodium. Right. Okay. You don't have to put salt in, co in 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 soft drinks. The point is they do. Royal Crown Cola, by the way, is gone, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that's in part because uh, Coke, pr you know, pressured them out of the out of the market. So the bottom line is there's salt in soda, and the, well, you can't tell because the sugar covers it up. And what's the reason for that salt being there? Uh, well, uh, they would tell you it's for hydration. I would tell you it's to make you thirstier. So you drink more soda? Absolutely. Doctor, we're going to take a break at that point for this week's Good Life Tips. Stay with us for information to help you make the positive life changes that we talk about on the show. When we return, I'll continue my discussion with Dr. Lustig. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Our guest today is Dr. Robert Lustig, author of the book, Fat Chance, Beating the Odds Against Sugar, Processed Food, Obesity, and Disease. Doctor, before break, we were talking about some of the problems that are occurring now within our diet that are causing a disastrous situation. Sugar is definitely a culprit in the situation. So what is the answer? What should we be doing outside of trying to eliminate the additional sugar? But what is it we can do that can help us alleviate this problem? All right. Well, there, that's two issues in one. Um, there's what you can do, and then there's what society has to do. So... I wrote the book to address both of those. Uh, what you can do, I can sum up in three words. Eat real food. So Michael Pollan said, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. That's seven words. I got it down to three. Eat real food. Because I don't have a problem with meat. He said mostly plants. I don't have a problem with meat. The problem is, what did the cow eat? You'll notice, when you go to the store, the meat is marbled, and we love it because that's where the flavor is. Well, guess what? That marbling is muscle lipid. That's intramyocellular lipid that came from muscle insulin resistant. Because that cow ate corn, that cow was corn-fed, it has the same disease we do. The only difference is we kill it before it gets sick. So when you think about what you're eating, just look at the meat in the store and realize that's what's happening to you for the same reasons. It used to take 18 months to get a cow from birth to slaughter. It now takes six weeks. Hmm. And the reason is because they fatten them up on corn. Well, guess what? They fattened us up on corn as well for the same reasons, because our livers can't handle it. So that's the big issue. Eat real food. Grass-fed beef is nice and lean and red and pink, and there's no marbling, and it tastes terrific. It's a little tougher um, you know, to cut, but it's absolutely gorgeous. The problem is it costs a lot of money because there isn't enough grass for all the cows. That's the problem. Same thing with processed food. Processed food is cheaper, so people buy it because they want to not spend money on food. They want to spend money on iPods and, you know, uh, mm. vacations instead. 
The problem is when you abdicate real food for processed food, you are basically doing your body damage for the same reasons you're turning into that cow. So it's about eating real food. Now, where do you find real food? Well, you know, you can find it at the supermarket. The problem is that if you go into the shelves, you've gone off the ranch. The, the, the real food's on the outside, and the real food spoils. And, of course, that's a problem because, you know, it's depreciation. So it costs more. So as long as we keep subsidizing processed food instead of real food, we will continue to have this problem. So that's what you can do personally. Then there's what society can do. How can we fix this problem? Well, I'm going to tell you right now. The executive and legislative branches of government are completely co-opted by the food industry. It's called agency capture. The FDA and the USDA are both captured by the food industry and cannot get us out of this mess. There's only one branch of government that actually can help us, and it's the legal branch. This is what happened with tobacco. This is how tobacco ultimately got litigated. And I'm, I'm envisioning the exact same uh, uh, strategy and the exact same uh, uh, path here as well. In fact, we have started a nonprofit in order to take on the food industry for just this reason called responsiblefoods.org. And I uh, uh, recommend all of your uh, listeners uh, log on and give us your email so that we can contact you with information. Doctor, for our critics, for people that might be saying, ah, this is just a, you know, a lot of baloney, what about the six-month-old babies that are obese? I, I mean, I was really surprised to see that statistic, six-month-olds. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's not just the obese six-month-old. How about the obese newborn? Now, Doctor, how, how is that happening? Is that from... That's from mother's form, diet. From the mother's diet, not from added sugar and formulas. It's from what the mothers are secreting into their milk. Both. It's both. Here's the problem. Worldwide... Birth weights are up 200 grams over the last 20 years. Pick your country, Russia, Israel, South Africa, United States, doesn't matter. Birth weights are up 200 grams. When you do DEXA scanning, when you look at the body composition of those newborns, that 200 grams is fat. They are laying down 200 grams extra in fat before they're even born. Now, do you want to tell me that, that that's, that's that newborn's personal responsibility, that they did that? You know, give me a friggin' break. The point is, this is what the mother ate. And the fact is that um, maternal weight gain is way up, gestational diabetes is way up, and it's because of mother's diet. So this has to be fixed before childhood obesity. Childhood obesity is running rampant in part because we have neonatal obesity. We have prenatal obesity because of mother's diet, because of what crosses the placenta. So it's no wonder we have an epidemic of obese six-month-olds. The point is, we can't fix that until we fix the food environment. The book is Fat Chance, Beating the Odds Against Sugar, Processed Food, Obesity, and Disease by Dr. Robert Lustig. Doctor, we already mentioned the YouTube video, Sugar the Bitter Truth. We mentioned responsiblefoods.org. Where else can our listeners go to to get more information about you and your work? Well, there's a whole lot of videos on there. I mean, I would suggest reading the book. I've got an enormous number of academic articles and papers uh, on the subject. With respect to, you know, what else is going on, uh, I would say, uh, you know, there's the Facebook page, uh, uh, facebook.com, Dr. Robert Lustig. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty out there. If people want more information, they are welcome to contact me, and I will be happy to su supply it. And as always, our listeners can get more information on our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows as podcasts, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, take part in the book club, and be sure to follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. Dr. Lustig, thank you so much for spending time with us today. As I said, this was a very interesting topic. I was floored by some of the information that I learned from your work, and I hope our listeners take the time to really pay attention to what you're doing because it can be life-changing. So thank you for being here with us. Uh, my pleasure. Last comment. Your, your listeners don't know they're fighting a war. This is a war between the food industry and you because what's good for you is bad for them, and what's good for them is bad for you, and there's no middle ground. You're fighting a war and you don't even know it. Knowledge is power and uh, it's time to, uh, to take back your food supply. Thank you so much, Doctor. Again, you are welcome here anytime you'd like to come back. We have so much more that we can discuss. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Mm -hmm.